next few weeks called The Gift. Um, as we're coming, continue to begin to explore kind of what we started off last week. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about the topic Salubona. Anybody remember this Salubona? That we were talking about Salubona in the Zulu language means I see you. And the response in Zulu is Sikona. Everybody say Sikona. And, and that means, and because you see me, I am now here. Saubona, I see you. Sikona, and because you see me, I am now here. We talked last week about uh, how we believe that God's coming to the world was a demonstration of Saubona. It was God saying to humanity, I see you, and that our response in faith and life uh, for, you know, life living in God is because you see me, uh, because you see us. Uh, we are now here. So we're going to be now talking about um, the series of The Gift. Um, and this, we're going to be kicking off this series, kind of staying in that same uh, chapter as we're in this season of Advent, uh, talking today about pregnant moments. Pregnant moments. So I believe we have a video that's going to start us off. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Listen to me. This boy is our son-in-law. He has married our daughter. Please don't remind me. <laughs> we offer to Sandra and Ellen to let them lead their own lives. Now it's obvious Ellen's not interested in going to medical school right now, but that could change. Give him a year. Just a year to do whatever he wants. If it doesn't work out, he could always reapply. Do you have a job between now and, and then? Yes, I do have a job. And I'm proud to say it's in the medical profession. Really? I'll be working with a major pharmaceutical firm, Benex Industries. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big company. What are you doing for them? Well, it's, it's kind of an entry-level job. Entry-level? Yeah, when the, the pill bottles come to the end of the assembly line, <laughs> I check to make sure that the safety seals are on the caps. Well, they want the money they need while Sandra goes to law school. How do you guess it's going to work out? Mom? Yes? I'm not going to law school. <laughs> What? I decided not to go to law school. What do you mean, you decided? Not to go to law well, this is our dream, and so I'm going to get a temporary job until the wilderness store opens, and then I'll be working side by side with my husband. Sandra, what are you saying? You have always wanted to go to law school. You've never talked about anything else. I changed my mind. Change it back. You owe us seventy-nine thousand six hundred cents, and I want my money now. I'm not going anywhere till I get my money. I'll take whatever she's got, empty her pockets. I'll let you know now. No, I'm not. No, I'm not having this. No. Well, really, both of us, we have to be calm. You calm down. If Elvin thinks that he is going to come in here and drag my baby off into some harebrained business scheme and ruin what is potentially the greatest legal mind of this century, he's going to have me to deal with. And then he can come to you for treatment. I understand and, 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 and I agree with what you're saying, but you just said to me, uh, why don't we? Give them a year. What I want to know is how is it that you get to rant and rave and I'm the one who has to be calm? Because that is my baby. But, if they but that's my baby no, too. Then you don't understand, honey. You did not have that child. I had that child. I was the one who was on that table screaming, take it out. That's, that's in my body. Sandra is going to become a lawyer. Yeah, okay. What do you want to do? Oh, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. She'll divorce him. <laughs> Sandra is in love with the boy, dear. Well, then you take Elvin. I did? Yes, you take what him. What am I going to do with him? You take him on a long trip in the country uh -huh. and drop him off. All right. So we talk about pregnant moments. My mind kind of went back to this clip. Uh, because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an 80s kid, and so, you know, we were always watching The Hustables. 
And, and if anybody got offended by Bill Cosby, I'm, I'm real sorry. This was pre all Bill Cosby stuff. Right? And that was, just seeing this Cliff Huxtable, right? I was called another guy. But uh, one of the things I, I thought was very powerful out of that clip was um, the power of a mother who had experienced a pregnancy and the kind of connection that she had with her child that she was willing to defend the destiny of that child all the way to the death. Now, I've never been pregnant before, obviously, amen. But I, I have been around three pregnancies with my wife. And the one, one of the things that I learned was that a pregnancy uh, is not just a one-time uh, kind of emotional experience, but it's a journey. Yes. That there's a lot of things that happen along the journey yes. of pregnancy that, that all are different and experienced uh, in different kinds of ways. And so we're going to talk about uh, pregnant moments a little bit as I believe that we're living into a season that we also have pregnant moments, not necessarily physical pregnant moments, but spiritual pregnant moments, social pregnant moments, where it feels like there is all this potential wrapped up in what can be, uh, and at the same time, we find ourselves dealing with all the different stages of pregnancy that oftentimes lead us to feeling hopeless and overwhelmed while we are in what my friend calls the already and the not yet. Any y'all ever had that kind of experience? Like, you, you, you're already in a place, but you're nowhere close to where you know you need to be. And I think we think about our communities, many times those of us that are involved in organizing and activism and service, uh, that oftentimes our communities are in the middle of, of, of where we are, but we're not where we need to be, and I think we experience that on personal levels as well. So let me say a prayer for us, and then we're gonna just jump into a little bit of some thinking together over the next few minutes. Lord, we just want to say thank you today because we recognize that you are the author of all life, not just physically, but even the life that happens in our world, the life that happens in our personal lives, the life that happens in our spiritual, emotional selves. And God, we say that we find life many times uh, being overwhelmed by the stages of our pregnant moments. And Lord, we pray today that your spirit would guide us through some thinking that would help us be able to be better prepared to lean into the world that you're making. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 1, uh, picking up where we left off in verse 39 uh, of Luke chapter 1, uh, it says, Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to a town in Judah in the hill country, straight to Zechariah's house, and greeted Elizabeth. Now when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. And she was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly, you're so blessed among women and the babe in your womb also blessed. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb skipped like a lamb for sheer joy. Blessed woman who believed what God said, believed every word would come true. So I first want to talk about, as we think about pregnant moments, I want to lift up this idea that pregnant moments are painful. Mm -hmm. That when Mary heard the announcement from the angel, uh, there were physical realities that started going on that aren't necessarily written inside the, the Bible story. Right? Like the Bible tells us about Mary, you know, singing her song and the angel coming next to her and she's found with favor. And I think it's important because sometimes Mary's portrayed, you know, kind of in this, you know, kind of misogynistic way of like this poor little lady who God just happened to somehow come down and bless her. But, but you know, it wasn't the way that story was told. The story was told that Mary was a powerful woman that found favor with God. That the angel showed up not to do Mary a favor, but because Mary was a powerful person in the eyes of God. Now, one of the things I think, though, is, is interesting is while all that's going on, I've been around, uh, you know, my wife long enough with our pregnancies to know that with pregnancy also comes morning sickness. 
I'm not going to talk about my wife's morning sickness. We're going to leave that alone because we got to go home together tonight. Amen. That was a joke. Y'all, some of y'all will catch it next week. That's all right. But comes morning sickness, comes a variety of other different things. Mary was facing not just something like morning sickness, but in the society she was growing up in, Mary was facing literally state violence because of what God had birthed inside of her. The Jewish culture had a practice that would have allowed her to be stoned. Can you imagine that God comes and visits you in a powerful way, setting forth your destiny and God's manifestation in your life, puts you at a place that makes it higher a possibility and a likelihood that you're going to be killed by the state. Somebody say a pregnant moment. That we love to sanitize this story about Mary. Oh, it's little Mary sitting in the couch with Jesus in the manger. But Mary was facing potential death that Mary in her pregnant moment of pain had to both experience the power of God affirming her life and at the same time have that uh, juxtaposed against the reality of her society. That God living in me potentially causes, causes me to be at risk to be killed. We must remember as we wait in the season of Advent that the pregnant moments that we have are full of potential, but they are also full of pain. And while we are inspired about what we know God wants to do, we equally must also continue to be faithful and motivated because of the reality of the world that we're in. This last week in San Francisco, I talked about it a little bit earlier, demonstrates more clearly the pain of pregnant moments. There's a part of me that continues to say, God, how long are we going to continue to have to see our loved ones murdered yes. on camera yeah. in broad daylight yeah. in front of our children? This, this particularly struck me uh, in a heavy way, and, and just to give you a, you know, just so you know, we're not trying to create this real theatric moment with the lights on me and the lights dim. There was a power outage in the neighborhood. Just so you know, I didn't want none of y'all feel like we was trying to hustle, right? <laughs> but one of the things that was hitting me as I was um, standing out there was where Brother Mario was shot was a part of the street that I walked easily every day for years. Walking along on 3rd and Gilman, catching a 15 to go to work, catching a 15 down because I was cutting school. Hey man, Lord have mercy on me. To go to BJ's. The, the burger spot on the corner. But how many times are we going to continue to have to watch our people being killed in the streets? How many times are we going to have to continue to see this kind of ridiculous behavior? And it doesn't just stop with the execution of Brother Mario. But if that wouldn't be enough, we have to be terrorized by the San Francisco Chronicle taking the playbook and demonizing him in the media and talking about some of the challenges that he had growing up. That we are living in a world that does not even understand or appreciate any kind of respect or honor for the dead. That even in his death, while his voice has been quieted, that people will see it as journalistic responsibility to defame him and destroy him and further terrorize his mother by talking about him as a convicted criminal. They strip away his humanity. And in Brother Mario, we see Oscar Gray. In Brother Mario, we see Rakia Boyd. In Brother Mario, we see Mike Brown. In Brother Mario, we see Laquan McDonald. Over and over, all these names after names after names, we find ourselves in these moments saying, every time it seems like we're getting some steps down the road, we have to continue to be faced with this pain. What I want to hold up for us is I believe that pregnant moments are painful. That it's not that God affirms or excuses the terror that is happening in our communities, but that this is a part of the process. That a part of the process, not God's process, but the process of evil being driven out means that at times we're going to have to coexist with the very thing that God is trying to root out of the world. 
And it's at the time where we are having to live alongside the horror of what's happening in the world that I believe God really tests us around what is it that we believe. Will we turn into the enemy when we become angry? Will we begin to reflect the devil's ways when we find our backs against the wall? And maybe it's not about Brother Mario for you. Maybe it's about things that are going on in your own personal life, in your own family life. Maybe you've got baby mama drama. Maybe you've got daddy. What's the, what's the alternative to baby mama drama? What is it? Baby daddy drama. All right. I didn't know if there was like a, you know, mama drama rhyme. I thought there might have been a daddy, like a baby daddy ratty or something. I don't know. <laughs> of the matter is, is we have, to, we have to exist in these painful moments, and we don't just have that, but on the same day that our brother Mario was shot, and that terror, terror happens here in San Francisco, we have a situation happening in San Bernardino, where terribly many people's lives were lost, with a country that continues to be silent around gun violence, yes. that has an obsession with violence, and an obsession with xenophobia, and dehumanizing folks creates a culture where people feel like the only way to get their points across is to pick up weapons and destroy one another. And then in light of that, the response, instead of trying to bring love to the families, is to try to demonize all of our Muslim brothers and sisters and create an environment that then puts their lives at risk. Somebody say painful moments. Pregnancy is about painful moments that we have to endure. But in the midst of painful moments, we must determine how we will respond. Are we gonna give it to our pain and our fear? Or will we remember that the same God who announced favor over our lives and our communities is the same God that is gonna bring us all the way into our live birth? That pregnant moments means that we must have faith, not just when the baby comes out, but we must have faith in the middle of the process. Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That if we wait upon the Lord and if we can handle the pain, then God will actually give us the capacity to make it through to our finished project. But the question is, it's like Rolaids. I don't know if some of y'all might not remember Rolaids. But they used to have a commercial that said, how do you spell relief? Y'all remember that? No, nobody remembers that. But the question is, when we're in the painful moments, I believe that there's an invitation from God around how will we channel our energy. One of the things I think is interesting to point out is for some reason, for poor people and particularly people of color, when we're terrorized, everybody, the first thing everybody wants to do is to ask us to forgive. Now like what I told folks when I was out there at the vigil, and it might not have been a theological correct answer, but it was an honest answer, I told them, I said, we do not forgive. I said, I don't forget the San Francisco Police Department. I, I want to forgive them when they change their ways. Now that might not be the theological answer, but that's why I need God to help me. Somebody say amen. Because <laughs> I wanted to tell them off. Somebody say amen. amen. Not y'all, y'all very spiritual people here at the way. But, but I think when we get these moments, we have to think about how is God asking us in these painful moments to not become the enemy, but to allow God to bring us into who he's calling us to be. The other thing that I think pregnant moments are is pregnant moments are shared. In this story, Mary arrives at Elizabeth's home and found that Elizabeth also was pregnant. Now before Mary's pregnant moment, Elizabeth had a pregnant moment. Mary was a virgin and Elizabeth was mature. Amen. She was What's the better word for mature? Mature, is that good? Six, what did you say, Mom? Senior citizen. My mom said she was a senior citizen. Seasoned. Oh. We got baby, daddy, ratty, and senior citizen. We all in the house here with the way. Pregnant moments are shared. Elizabeth was seasoned, mature, and now infertile, yet God birthed life in both Mary and Elizabeth. Mary didn't have 
have to experience her season alone, but rather she experienced it with her relative. And when they got together, what was inside, the baby that was inside Elizabeth, leaped for joy within her. Here's the point I want us to get out of this, that pregnant moments in God are never experienced alone, but they are shared. God always has us experiencing things together, whether we realize it or not. You see, as God has us in pregnant moments, God always has people for us to experience these moments together with. And that's why the enemy is always going to try to get you by yourself. Oh, you best believe that when you find yourself getting into trouble, the enemy is going to try to get you isolated. Because when you're isolated, you think that you're the only person going through what you're going through. But when we realize that pregnant moments are shared, we realize that there's somebody else that's actually going through the season that I'm going through and that I actually will be able to go through my season better when I find myself going through it with other people. Woo. Somebody say share. Pregnant moments are shared. As we come together during this season of Advent and we wait on God together, we are bearing witness that there is something powerful that happens when we stay together. Now, it's very interesting for us to find fault with one another. It was, it was unfortunate as I saw some of the town halls that happened last week as folks were trying to wrestle with uh, uh, what do we do in the middle of these crises and how do we respond. People became very disjointed and people began to accuse one another and say, you know, you don't, you don't deserve the mic or you're not the person that should speak for the people or you're not the person that should be involved. And everyone became isolated. But I thank God there was powerful leadership from Sister Ranisha from San Francisco and our Black Lives Matter group that call for everybody to stay together. We must recognize as God is bringing us through pregnant moments to birth his gift into the world, we must find ways to stay together. If you're having drama in your family life, I want to encourage you that the best thing for you and your family is not for you to isolate yourself from them. <laughs> I just saw one of my buddies in the back laugh. I saw him. <laughs> but the best thing to do is to stay together. If you find yourself feeling disjointed in your community and feeling like nobody is providing the kind of leadership and support and advocacy, don't get off on the island by yourself, but stay together. If someone has frustrated you here at church, which will happen often, <laughs> all the church veterans say amen. amen. People in church don't bother you. And let me just give you this quick commercial. Here's why. No other place are you going to get all these different people from different backgrounds with different points of view. Come, you know, some of y'all don't like people to sit next to you. Some of y'all like to sit real close to people. Some people don't like to be touched. Some people like to touch everybody. Some people loud. Some people quiet. When we put all of us together, it is just a recipe for getting offended. Right? But look at the person next to you and say, stay together. Yeah. And when we recognize that God wants to birth something, when we recognize that our church is in a pregnant moment, when we recognize that our community is in a pregnant moment, we recognize that there is power when we stay together. In times like these, when we are facing violence on every hand, we need to stay together. When we're living in a time where the news media is telling us to fear our brothers and sisters that are from the Middle East, we must commit ourselves to stay together. This is how we follow Jesus. This is how we live into the reality of Advent. I want to invite you to look at this next clip. Uh, from one of the movies that I like called The Gladiator around this idea of staying together.
In that scene, how many remember that scene from Gladiator? In that scene, one of the things I loved about it was Russell Crowe's character Maximus, which became the name of my dog, but that's not important. But, <laughs> but one of the things I love about that movie is when they found themselves in the heat of the battle, right? One of the things I love was that he said, if we are going to survive, we've got to stay together. We've got to work together. And he did not abandon his philosophy when the enemies came out against him. But rather, he got in his posture and he kept screaming, stay together. He kept screaming, stay together. And then he started screaming, hold, hold, hold. I believe that some of us, when we get in the middle of our challenges, we must begin to become very loud and very demonstrative to one another that we must stay together. That we must survive together. That the only way we are going to survive our pregnant moments is for us to do it together. Look at the person next to you and say, hold on. Even if it feels like you want to give up, even if it feels like you want to throw in the towel, even if it feels like you want to go on your way, hold on and let us stay together. In Acts chapter 4, the scripture tells us that when the people of God that were waiting on Peter and them to be released from prison, it said that they all got together and they prayed and the place that they were in was shaking because they did it together. I'm telling you that even though we're dealing with this violence that is happening all across our world and we're in the middle of a lot of xenophobia and a lot of hopelessness and a lot of despair, and some of us are dealing with things in our personal lives and family lives. I believe that in our pregnant moments, if we remember they are shared, then we remember that the power of God is calling us to stay together. Pregnant moments are painful. Pregnant moments are shared, but pregnant moments are also spirit-filled. One of the things I love in this story of Mary and Elizabeth is when they came together, the scripture says that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy and Elizabeth was filled with the spirit. That in the middle of her pregnant moment, that both included pain, Mary certainly included some pain, Elizabeth as a senior woman was going to have a whole other conversation, pain, it was shared but it was spirit Field. I want to tell you that I believe that there is a feeling of God from the Spirit that can only come when we're in the middle of crisis and when we're in the middle of going through some stuff together. But when we make it through, we realize that the Spirit wants to come to us to do through us what we could never do in our own power. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and 19, Paul says, I consider that the present sufferings in our world are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. When Elizabeth began to get filled with the Holy Spirit, Mary began to sing a prophetic song that I want to read for you, verses 45 through 55. Mary said, I am bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What the God, what God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose name is holy, set apart from all other, his mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses. He pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised, beginning with Abraham right up to now. What was Mary saying? Mary was saying, I believe that we will win. You see, when Mary got filled with the Spirit, she began to recognize that her pregnant moment was going to be able to be more powerful than any pain that anybody in her community could bring, that anybody that was opposing her could bring. And I think it's important for us to realize that while we are in pregnant moments of waiting for the manifestation of God in our world, that God wants to fill us with his spirit while we wait. Yes. 
that God wants to change our confession while we wait. As I close, I close with this frame. In this season of Advent, we can't control what's happening in the world, but we can control what's happening in us. We can't control the pain we're exposed to through pregnant moments, but we can choose who to share our pregnancy with. And as we share our pregnancy, we can be positioned to be filled with the Spirit of God beyond anything we've ever seen. And as we are filled with the Spirit, we can give birth to the gift that God wants to bring in the world. The gift is God's world made available through Jesus. The gift is hope amidst the despair that the Prince of Peace is coming. The gift is that xenophobia never wins, but rather love conquers all. The gift is the presence of God in the middle of the hood like Nazareth. God showing up to unlikely characters, turning the world upside down. As God brings us the gift, may we be made available to become vessels that bring the gift of God to others. I'm here to tell you that the only way we're gonna survive these pregnant moments, living in the already and the not yet, is we're gonna to have to learn how to stay together and how to get filled with the Spirit of God. There are no silver bullets, brothers and sisters. And the one thing I'm learning, even from a lot of this movement work, is if you think you're gonna survive resisting injustice in the world by simply being pissed off, you're going to burn out kind of quick. Because there's so, I, I hope I didn't offend nobody by saying pissed off. Angry. If you, if you think you're going to fuel it just by anger, it's not going to happen. We must get full of some deep divine spirit that can drive out the evil in our world, drive out the evil in our homes, drive out the evil in our communities that we might see God make the world anew. Stand with me, everyone.